So we're going to the next uh, milestone and many, there are many questions here about first paying customers. And uh, it, the first question is from Marin Georgiev, which is co-founder of ICS Technologies, which is product company. So the first paying customer for the product, how did you get in? That's a great question. I wish I have a great story behind it. We just launched the app and uh, someone downloaded and paid for it. We didn't do we didn't do shit sorry for the expression and probably uh, the high expectations again i don't have a great story around it i i always uh, prefer to swim uh to swim in a lake with a lot of fish and uh, not fish in uh, the ocean on a raft so uh, the notion of going to establish markets with very mature marketplace i think is of essence to me uh, it, it just allows you to cut a lot on the marketing fat that you would spend on acquiring customers via Google, via Facebook, via LinkedIn, God knows what, Pinterest, Quora. So anything that allows you to raise your customer acquisition cost, I would deem uh, hackable. So for us, it was just launching on uh, Shopify and being able to uh, roller cost right on their, uh, on, on their established marketplace. Second question is pretty much uh, the same in his first part. It is from Anton Sotirov, which is CTO of Sizam. And uh, it's more about how many turndowns you had before signing your first, first uh, client and probably turndowns in your case means uh, what was your conversion rate at the beginning? It was horrible. Uh, so the, the fact that Shopify is a very, I would say, fluctuating marketplace. So... Uh, what is Shopify? Shopify wanted to bring the idea that everyone can be an entrepreneur. And this is before the dropshipping uh, times. So everyone can start their own business. E-commerce is so accessible, which we not, now see it is, but um, anyone can be their own uh, boss and uh, have this and have that. So this attracted a lot of people who wanted to get their hands dirty and experiment. They didn't want to have the nine to five, so they wanted to become entrepreneurs. And of course the conversion rate is bad. Like how many people are going to fail? A lot of them, maybe 90%. So you see a number of installs and a number of uninstalls, which is way beyond your reach. So um, conversion rate wasn't good. And Shopify was, I, I think they're uh, successful into educating more and more people on to what exactly to follow. Uh, then dropshipping came. So this eliminated the whole uh, logistics out of the picture. You just have to make sure you have uh, a good store. You know how to run ads and uh, traffic and then uh, everything else will be taken care of you. Very successful uh, acquisition, by the way, uh, from Shopify. Uh, and we, I, I wouldn't say we had a lot of uh, turndowns, but I would say that we had a lot of screw-ups. Just because we were... Um, running very very fast there were uh, uh there were a few leaking buckets into the product which were actually uh causing us trouble and of course those were fixed with the time but we have had a lot of customers uh being very nasty and saying this doesn't work that doesn't work we could get away with it because we were the only product on the market pretty much that were offering those things but as soon as competitors started coming you know they had to disappoint customers as well. So essentially we started working on making sure that those holes are closed, that the ship is not leaking and that more and more we shift towards stability and quality and don't lean that much uh, towards a very, very fast execution. I would say that this is like the mid stage that pretty much we are at uh, right now. And just one small bracket, we have had a lot of customers who tried the product in the beginning, they thought it's absolutely atrocious, and only to come six or eight months later and say, wow, you guys did this, you know, let, let me sign up, I wanna be your customer. And those people are still with us. Just because when you're super bad, and then when you go and make, uh, I would say a huge climb of, of improvement, people notice this more, then starting very high and then just dropping the quality. Okay, great, great answer. And the second question is the third, I believe, is uh, from Bistra Papazova. She's CEO of uh, CoBuilder International. And the question is how to scale the sales while being a small or medium company? I think this is a great question. So 
uh, reality Bistro is that we didn't have a sales team. Uh, I would say that we tried to mimic one, but there wasn't any dedicated person uh, just because of the nature of the business. The small and medium enterprises are pretty much very versatile. Uh, while there are some companies that require a, a, a good sales process, we weren't in the position to attract those type of customers. Now with Yotpo, uh, we are in such a position. They have 80 people in New York who are doing only sales, so very heavy on prospecting. They, uh, 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 they pretty much target very specific brands. They approach every brand with a specific set of strategy, when they're going to meet them, what they're going to talk to them, who would be their point of contract, who's going to introduce them. So a very, very, uh, I would say, sophisticated effort into prospecting um, of whoever they're going to approach. Our approach was let's create a very good sales service product. So I would argue that creating a very sales service product, very good sales service product, or being able to utilize the product led growth, it's much more sustainable than actually having salespeople. Why? Because every salesperson can have X amount of closes, uh, let's say a month, versus when you try to eliminate yourself from the product and make it as simply as simple as possible. And of course, you can utilize videos, you can utilize intercom, uh, which I recommend. You can utilize very good email flows. You can utilize a great service. You can hop on a call with a customer and then uh, repurpose it as a blog post or a, or, a, or a webinar or a case study. I would argue that those pillars are much more effective long-term and um, would create evergreen knowledge compared to actually scaling a sales guy. For me, I think that the founder needs to have the, 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 the sufficient uh, sales, sales uh, tactics and then probably need to transfer those to the support because those are the first people, uh, uh, the first line of people that, uh, that customers meet. So if they know how to close the deal, if they, if they have good understanding about the, the product and let's say two or three preliminary tactics, they should be okay. Super great answer. And actually I'm uh, seeing this after even uh, not for small and medium uh, markets, but even for uh, enterprise markets when, where the sales process is like six to 18 months and you need, you're selling something for 200K or so. Recently I have a call with George Brashnaro from Nemechek and he also said that he's seeing for the last two years that the product marketing is actually the main uh, thing and uh, uh, sales are turning just into accounts that are actually uh, um, using the well-generated and positioned leads only to actually just finish the, the sales. And uh, this is why we are actually aggregating the best product marketing agencies and experts we can find in the UK. So uh, the next question is from uh, Vasil Tabakov, who is a managing partner of SQA Begue. And the question is how and when did you distinguish your free and paid versions of the product you mentioned about the Pareto um, distribution? Um, I don't actually remember. I think uh, just from the start, from the get-go, we had a, a paid version and a free version of the product so you could be on a plan or you could be uh just topping up credits essentially um so i i think from the get-go we were like this but the plans we changed at, at least a couple of times and to all of the features surrounding the the the, the plans we were just adding uh and um and moving to a higher tier to a lower tier making something free distinguishing how good is uh, good enough and uh, all of that. One advice that I can give on this topic, I don't know if this answers the question, is, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, whenever you decide to change the plans for whatever reason, always leave the customer who bought a cheaper plan on legacy. Never touch those customers that already got a deal. Don't try to uh, leech money out of them. They would hate it. They would one star you. They would just make your life a horror. So whatever, whoever got the promotion, just leave them on legacy. So be it. Uh, but change always the plans for all the new customers instead. Okay. 
great question. The next one is from Bonnie Likomanov Dimova, which is partner and head of BI in Balkan Services, which is a service company. How to calculate the price and event model? Oops, sorry. So the question is how how to calculate, calculate the price and the unit economics. Sure. Like if a text message should cost one cent or five cents, and how do you calculate whether something is uh, uh, let's say twenty dollars or two hundred dollars? Is this the question? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, probably Bonnie, if she's here, can uh, uh, actually specify. And meanwhile, I'm actually sharing the next question which is also about uh, find the best sales approach and pricing structure probably it's more they're more interested about pricing this is from christo roinov which is business development and division how do you make your pricing probably uh <laughs> magic so <laughs> like i i, I just want to say that um now I realize how much I don't know about pricing after dealing with Yotpo. Uh, I can tell you how they uh, distinguish the new pricing which we're gonna launch, which I find much more sophisticated for a startup like ours. Uh, and I would argue that in the beginning we had a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, gut feeling decisions. I just put myself into an e-commerce owner and I'm like, how much am I willing to pay for this software? This is, this is the approach we did. We went and we did research with the competitors. We saw um, what they're charging and what we can get away for charging. Um, and then this is how we actually price the packages. It was trial and error. There are some customers, just have it in mind, who wouldn't buy your product because you're too cheap. They would come to you and say, how, how something so good can cost only $100 a month. They're, this is a scam. So always have the cost for pricing. This is uh, a great, great way and probably in a continuation to I think Bistro's question. So you can always open the door for, uh, for talking with the salesperson or with the founder, uh, whoever outer ego you, was, you wish to use. Uh, and uh, uh, just you, for, for calls for pricing, listen, take notes and make sure that uh, whatever the customer wants, you can bundle in a package. Like this is like typical, uh, I would say US uh, company. No pricing, calls for pricing, they take you to the sales cycle and then uh, you learn how much this product really costs. And it's negotiable. You have to know all the time this is negotiable. Versus us, the European model, let's not waste time, be very open and upfront about the pricing. This is how much uh, you charge, this is how much you do. So for us in the beginning, just to answer the question in a little bit of greater detail, we calculated what type of margins we wish to have. And then we were seeing uh, how this uh, relates to the other companies in the sector. I mentioned that we could get away with charging more because we had more features. And uh, I, I would argue that the product was much more sophisticated than others. So essentially, we put a, uh, an amount that we were comfortable with. And the cool thing was that the more text messages you sent, the higher volume you uh, uh, you you essentially put on the table. With the higher volume, you get a drop on the SMS price. So with the time, the margins were uh, were, were getting uh, more favorable uh, for us. But again, how Yotpo does it, they conduct interviews, they get in touch with different type of customers, they tier them based on historical spending, they tier them based on features usage, uh, 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 they, they send an email, they try to get them on a call, they have a very, uh, I would say, uh, result-driven approach uh, and based on what used to work with them and what, again, the competition does and how one feature is utilized. So the, if a feature is underutilized, they're more likely to move it to a higher plan. For them, this means that, okay, this is not something for everyone. Let's, let's, let's charge more for that. So have this in mind as well. The, the top bottom features, like the absolute must, again, free of charge. And then if you want a little bit more sophisticated, Let's just keep the lower pricing and then a couple of more uh, steps. And always, uh, like, there is a great book by uh, Barry Schwartz. It's called The Paradox of Choice. Uh, don't have 100 plans. Just have uh, one, two, three maximum and maybe one colors for pricing just because the more you get, the more uh, confused people get. And at the end of the day, they, they don't buy anything because they don't know how to get started. 
Okay, great. Sorry if that was too long. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally love uh, customer interviews and totally believe in them. And uh, I, I'm happy that your pool actually are so uh, great in that. And uh, the next question uh, is from uh, Christo is thanking you. And the next question is from Rostislav Georgiev, who is the uh, owner of uh, Gworos service company. And the question is how important it is to have a subscription based model and to do you, and do you find it applicable in a service oriented business where most customers require upfront evaluation for a job task and so on. And also how did you guys target it and manage to onboard bigger enterprise customers? Any tips on that? Is this a service type of a question or a SaaS type of a question? Yeah, it's a service company and uh, it's interested uh, to build its own product and uh, is asking how to implement subscription-based model into uh, actually service-oriented business and how to apply it to targeting uh, bigger enterprise customers. Um, so I don't have a ton of experience yet with enterprise level customers. Uh, they're called logos in our, uh, in our, in our uh, vertical. I think Yotpo are very good. And again, it requires a great preparation. It requires introductions. It requires being at fairs. I, I don't think a large enterprise will just come and buy your product out of the blue uh, just because they don't operate in this way. Uh, they usually have an agency uh, that is taking care of a part of their business or if they're large enough, they, ho they have a whole department. So question is, how do you make yourself visible to that department? I would argue the more evergreen content that, that you create, the higher the chance that uh, this gets uh, into, their, uh, into their view or uh, into their, I don't know how to say it. I forgot the word, so uh, you would understand me. So the, the more that you do, uh, I, would, I, would, I would also think that uh, for us, at least getting bigger customers with us, those are channeled through agencies. If not, then those go to fairs. So uh, there, is, there are very big fairs for e-commerce owners where you can just go and meet all of those super huge brands like, uh, let's say, Fashion Nova, Nike, Quicksilver, Billabong. So there, what... Uh, big companies are doing is that they're teaming up uh, with uh, different type of players. They're organizing, for instance, dinners. And you go to organize a dinner and then you invite 20 people, you pay the bill for those uh, 20 people, and then you talk them over your product, uh, you talk them over how you can help them. And this is how you kind of like establish the relationship. It, it will never play out. Again, think about the bigger the business, the bigger the institution, the longer the sales cycle. And you need to monitor this. So monitor how big is your sales cycle, monitor at what point you, uh, you face a collection or after how many days you're able to actually start selling. But uh, essentially try to create those relationships in a uh, in, uh, in number of ways, like uh, liking their posts on LinkedIn, uh, commenting on them, uh, seeing which events that they will be, uh, they will be attending to, uh, participating in their podcasts, uh, you know, uh, webinar sorry asking them relevant questions like try to be genuinely interested in what they do and uh, whenever you approach them um, i would always say that just because of the long sales cycle think about what you want to offer for how many months you want to offer when you're gonna make the first step into closing uh and uh yeah this is what I can say. I don't know if it was useful, but this yeah, is Yeah, to totally. And it was actually the, uh, qu the question from uh, the 13 miles on first paying customers. And it was about the enterprise customers. And we have uh, one question from the 15th milestone product market fit, which is the last milestone from the second phase validation. 